please welcome Nora Volkov. And I, I, I like to say that I am a product of the bellicose nature of men. On my father's side, the Russian Revolution, my father is the grandson of Leon Trotsky. And the only place that gave political asylum to Trotsky was Mexico, because all of the other countries were afraid of antagonizing Stalin. And Stalin, in his relentless uh, extermination of Trotsky's family, had left my father an orphan at a very young age. So Trotsky took care with him, uh, and that's why he ended up in Mexico. On my mother's side, she was born um, in Madrid, and the Spanish Civil War exploded in such a way that both her father and older brother were sent as part of the Republicans to fight against the Franco uh, um, group. And Madrid, where my mother was born and lived with her family, was bombarded on a daily basis. So in Mexico, a group of very well-intentioned citizens um, convinced the president to invite the families to let those children that were very young to come to Mexico to avoid them from being exterminated on the bombing of Madrid. And these children, which later were called by the term Niños Morelianos, which means children of Morelia, because that's where they were, um, will be separated from their families until the war was over, and many of them actually never return. And that's actually what led my mother and her family to emigrate to Mexico when Franco took power in order to reunite their family. And so that's how both my parents met and got married and had four, four, four daughters. Because Mexico has been a country that has an open door for political exiles. I grew up in the house where Trotsky had lived. And, and as a child, it was, it was an incredible house because, because you could explore it, because it was full of history and secrets and mysteries. And as children play, we will recreate out of those objects another reality. But you could not escape, even with the playfulness of children, that darkness that falls into a place where someone has been assassinated. Nor can you escape the significance that it is for both of your parents to have their families decimated by the brutality of men against men. So we were brought with two principles. One of them, when it comes to freedom, to human freedom, you do not compromise. And the second one, you have to do something with your life that will improve the life of others. My father being a scientist, my brain being horrifically curious, and particularly curious about itself, <laughs> led me to realize very early on what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a scientist, but I also was incredibly ambitious because what I wanted to do was to understand how the human brain works. So I went into medical school, and I chose medical school because it allows you the privilege of an interaction with humans that is not hidden by expectations or, or fear or, 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 or wanting to make you have a certain reaction. It's a, it's a real relationship, and yes, you're exposed to illness, suffering, death, but you're also exposed to healing and to helping others. And there are many memories that collide in my brain about those years as a medical student. But there's one that emerges, actually. I was a four-year medical student. In Mexico, you go to medical school for six years. I was actually, interestingly, in the hospital, it's a public hospital, and in the emergency room where a Trotsky had been brought when Jack Morcader had attacked him with an ice pick and where, where he would die. Now, 
It was a Friday night, and Friday nights are very, very busy in emergency rooms because you get all of the patients that end up there from accidents of people drinking and partying. But it was not so late for that. Um, it was around 8, 9 o'clock. And there's this ambulance that comes, and they, um, they bring a woman, a middle-aged woman. She's overweight. She's dressed in brown, very clean clothes. Her shoes are, are new, but she's dead. And the physician calls me and says, uh, Nora, go tell the son of this woman that her mother is dead. So I go into the waiting room, and I see this young man, 15, 16 year old, in a corner, intimidated by his surroundings. And I have to tell him that her mother has been killed by a drunken driver. And as I stand there and I see his reaction and I'm useless to do anything about it, a thought comes into my brain, the thought of my uncle, my favorite uncle, one of the brothers, one of the children that ended up uh, being separated from the family because he was an alcoholic. And despite his charisma, generosity, warmth, he was tainted by the fact that he was an alcoholic. And in the family, we couldn't speak about it. It was as if it did not exist, nor could we approach him to say, why don't you get treated? And that memory replays and replayed and replayed in my brain, not just as a medical student, not just in emergency room departments, in inpatient hospitals, as already a full-blown physician, because we would be getting constantly patients that were ending up there because of the consequences of drugs and alcohol, accidents, cirrhosis, cancer, psychosis, and we will treat them. But we never address the cause that brought them there. And so my brain, finding this sort of dissociation, says this is evidently the wrong thing, decided at that point, well, my next step after medical school is to do a PhD that will allow me to understand the effects of drugs in the brain. I applied and I was accepted to MIT. I got a scholarship and I was going to go there when the randomness of events just diverted me. And the random, a random event was a Scientific American a scientific America that actually described for the first time a technology called positron emission tomography, which is a brain imaging technology that allowed you to look inside the human brain, that allowed you to take pictures of how the brain was working. And of course, that mesmerized me. It mesmerized me because heretofore, there was no way to get inside the human brain except from electroencephalographic recordings, which were surface-based. And here was a technology that transformed that. So I got all excited and I come to my father, and I always was able to convince my father for the most bizarre things, provided that they were related to science. <laughs> so he sent me off to New York City, which is where, uh, at New York University, where they were doing uh, studies with these brain imaging technologies. So I show up to Bellevue Psychiatric Hospital, which is where the studies were being done. I show up to the office of the chairman uh, of the Department of Psychiatry, and I, the secretary who's there impeding the advance of anybody into the office, I say, um, good morning, I'm uh, Nora Volkov. I just finished medical school, and I want to speak with the chairman of the department, Dr. Robert Cancro. And, and she looks at me and says, do you have an appointment? And I said, no, I do not have an appointment, but I want to speak with the chairman of the Department of Psychiatry. So this woman stands up, goes inside the office, comes out, opens the door, and says, go in. And that act, the willingness of Dr. Cancro, who was the chairman at that time, to listen to a medical student unannounced from Mexico, not only to listen to her, but to link her with the group that was doing the study, 
shifted me. So I had to say no to MIT, which was actually very surprised that a, a Mexican, a Mexican student with a scholarship was saying no to them. <laughs> and that's how I embark in what has become my professional career, the use of imaging to extract information from the brain of people that are addicted, to try to understand what happens that leads them to the compulsive administration of drugs. As a scientist, my brain questions me, and I have this dialogue all the time. And one of the things that I always ask, because I'm very critical of my brain too, so I say, and of what I do, I, I actually am critical. And I said, okay, you've spent all of these years, and uh, well, to what extent this research of looking into the brain, brain has in any way shifted your understanding of the disease of addiction? And, and, the, and, and there, are, there are several events that I could point out, but, but the most salient of them was, I was in the lab at Brookhaven National Laboratory wandering around and I realized I could distinguish the brain of a person that's addicted from the brain that, of a person that was not addicted. And it was very, very simple to do. The person that was addicted, his area of the brain on the frontal cortex was not functioning. Now, this was not intuitive because I mean, it has been classically considered that addiction is a disease of the limbic brain, the emotions, and the frontal cortex was not involved. And yet, the data show that this area on top of our eyes, the orbital frontal cortex, was profoundly impairing people that were addicted. And so I always say to my, my, my postdocs, look guys, the data is the data. And if you are not willing to look at it because it doesn't fit your criteria, do something else. And that is actually where it hit me. It hit me because there was, I didn't know anything about the orbital frontal cortex. But what it hit me was I had started to read about findings that were showing that the orbital frontal cortex was disrupted in individuals suffering from obsessive compulsive disorders, or OCD. And that's when it hit me. Because I said to my brain, well, what do these two disorders have in common? In OCD, you have the obsessions and the compulsions of washing and washing and washing your hands, even though the person knows they are clean, and even though they no longer want to wash them. They cannot stop it. On the side of addiction, what you have is the ruminations about getting the drug, and once they take it, to compulsively take it again and again and again, even though many of the patients will tell you Doc, I don't even know why I'm taking it. It's no longer pleasurable. I just cannot stop it. And indeed, that was many, many years ago. And since then, there's been as many, many, many very important findings that have helped us identify the molecular mechanisms by which the frontal cortex gets damaged by drugs and how that, in turn, leads to the, self, the loss of self-control that you see in addiction. And this, in turn, of course, has resulted in, in, in research to try to approach it from a very different perspective, like with new treatments, vaccines, uh, ways to strengthen those circuits that have been damaged. And I wish I could tell you that that knowledge has actually changed and the way that the healthcare system embraces the problem of drug addiction, because that is not the case. And that brings me to another period on my childhood when we were having dinner, my three sisters and my mother, and there is a, a telegram brought to her. She reads the telegram and then she starts to cry. And she goes into her room and closes the door. Now I had never seen my mother cry. And, and as a child and, and as an adult, you don't want people to cry, and I, and I was knocking the door because I wanted to console her. But she didn't open. Next morning, my father told us that her father had died. Now, many years later, and I was already working as a, as a physician doing this research on brain imaging, on addiction, and my mother, when she was dying of ovarian cancer, said to me, Nora, we need to speak. There is something I've never told you about my family. 
And she proceeded to reveal to me that her father had been an alcoholic and unable to stop his drinking, he had committed suicide. And I remember, and I said, well, why didn't you tell me? And she said to me, Nora, I did not want you to feel less of him. I didn't want you to lose his respect. And I see, as I think backward, my mother is dead. And I say, if I could speak with her, what would I like to tell her? I would like to tell her, you shouldn't feel embarrassed. Drug addiction is a disease. But as I tell this story, I know that words are not sufficient but it is science, the power of science, that can lead us to come up with solutions. And in the case of drug addictions, with solutions that will allow us one day treat drug addiction like we treat any of the other medical diseases. Yes, I started with this incredibly ambitious idea as a child, so very naive that I'm embarrassed, to understand how the human brain works. But, on the other hand, what I've come to realize is by studying the changes in the brain that drugs produce that lead to the loss of self-control and self-determination, I come to realize also that we're starting to understand the neurobiological circuits that enable us to exert free will, without which the concept of freedom is meaningless. Well, crack down equations look about and describe the quadrant of the like matter, which is all for the mass. Like the left side, the most for the force. The puzzling thing is, those equations have what if someone was so